Thank you for joining us today, and we are glad that you are taking time out of your day to view this one-hour webinar. My name is Dave Helge, Vice President of Maintenance and Safety for Ideal Lease. Ideal Lease is committed to providing our customers and potential customers with safety and compliance information to assist you in enhancing your safety and loss control program. Due to the pandemic, we have canceled our on-site safety seminars in 2020 to protect the safety and health of our employees and you, our customer. In lieu of the seminars, we have been presenting one-hour webinars over the last three months. Today's webinar is the final webinar and number six in the series. The topic for today is developing a proactive safety and loss control program. Today we will look at what some of the safest fleets in the industry are doing with their safety programs to reduce accidents, driver turnover, and liability exposure. Enjoy the webinar. So this is the last in a series of six webinars that we're hosting at Ideal Lease. And the title to this webinar is Developing a Proactive Safety and Loss Control Program. I spent a good part of my career um, working for insurance companies that insured uh, truck lines as a loss control engineer. And I uh, took a look at, uh, over my career, thousands and thousands of truck lines. And it became obvious early on in uh, my consulting career that uh, there was a great uh, disparity uh, in the safety departments of those uh, motor carriers. Um, you had carriers that were doing an outstanding job with compliance, uh, and that's basically where they stopped. You had other carriers that uh, weren't even close to compliance. And then uh, there was, I would say, 10% of the carriers that I took a look at that really had a proactive safety and loss control program in place. And what I mean by that, that they're, they're actively every day uh, working to prevent losses. And they do that through a number of uh, ways. So, so over the years and looking at these carriers, it became obvious to me that they were doing things that, that other carriers weren't. And uh, that was creating uh, the results that they had in an excellent uh, safety and loss control program. So I've got a quote up here on the slide that says, do what today others won't, so tomorrow you can do what others can't. So these carriers, by proactively uh, doing a lot of things uh, surrounding their safety and loss control program, were able to take advantage of that in controlling risk, liability, insurance premiums, all those kind of things, uh, because they were all out in front of their safety and loss control program. The other thing is they generated a lot of data, and we'll talk about data later, but uh, that is very important. As we, as we look at safety in our industry today, um, you know, I've, I've heard people discuss safety as it, it just happens. We just have accidents. We had a rash of bad accidents. You know, it, it's like this thing that's floating out in the air that nobody can put their arms around and control. It's just, it's, it's there. And that's not true. Today, carriers can control, uh, safety, uh, and they can track record through data, able to tell where their issues are and attack those issues um, to, uh, to reduce their losses. So after taking a look at the uh, proactive uh, carriers, uh, there's seven areas of uh, focus that they, are, they uh, put emphasis on in their safety and loss control program. 
So we'll go through each one of these, driver selection, retention, driver training programs, driver supervision, accident prevention programs, driver vehicle out of service rates, recognition and incentives. And then lastly, we'll take a look at uh, using business intelligence and technology to manage risk. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, driver uh, selection and retention. So as I looked at these carriers, they focused on this area quite a bit. They spent a lot of time in the driver selection prior to making a job offer. They used all of the information that they had available to them. They just didn't uh, make a reasonable attempt, as the FMCSA says that we should do, to inquire to past employers. They uh, they fully exhausted, you know, three to four different methods of getting that information before they stopped. And then if they couldn't get information, they, they, chances are they weren't hiring the driver. Uh, they used PSP, uh, pre-employment screening program. But the selection process was more intense uh, than would you see at just a typical carrier. And then on the driver retention side, you know, I saw carriers with driver turnover rates in the single digits. And I'm talking some big carriers, three, four, five hundred trucks with less than 10 percent driver turnover. And how they were doing that is the first thing I noticed is employee involvement. The drivers uh, were involved in everything that any other employee was involved in. So, you know, if there's a Christmas party uh, committee, they were on that committee. The drivers truly felt like they were an important part of the business. They were respected by all levels of management. And they enjoyed staying there. It was, they enjoyed working there. Um, you know, as you see a lot of the, the data on why drivers leave, it's not always money. Money is not the first one. You know, trust, the trust has been broken to, they feel like they've been lied to or uh, deceived by a dispatcher. All those kind of things figure into people leaving. So these folks work really hard at uh, retaining the drivers, retaining the good drivers that they had. They had a job description, full job description, uh, purpose. And it was emphasized to all the drivers, your job is necessary. You know, we couldn't do this business without you. And that was uh, one of the things that I saw that was emphasized over and over again many ways to the drivers, driver appreciation week, all those type of things, you know, they took advantage of um, little things on what they had in their trucks, keeping the trucks clean, uh, relationship with technicians, all that was very important in retaining drivers. The other uh, part there on the career path, um, they gave their employees a career path. All their employees had a career path. And for drivers that would start out as a driver, you could uh, work yourself up into, they had different levels of drivers, driver trainers, you know, senior drivers, those type of thing. And then they also gave them a career path and if they wanted to leave that, that occupation inside their company. So it was interesting. I would see drivers that turned into technicians. They would help them with the schooling, all that, or drivers that turned into operations people, sales folks. They, if a driver had any idea that they wanted to better themselves, they help them do that. And if they weren't satisfied with their current job occupation or position, then they would help them uh, correct that. So the benefits of low driver turnover, uh, I can't emphasize enough that there's a direct correlation between driver turnover and accident frequency rate. All of the insurance carriers that I've worked for in my career, the underwriting report that went back uh, after our, our inspection of a motor carrier always had to have what is their driver turnover frequency rate? 
because those underwriters knew that, that there was a direct correlation. The higher that driver turnover frequency rate, the higher the accident frequency. So reduce losses and costs, better customer service when there's a retention of drivers, when the customer sees the same driver over and over and over again for years and years and years that builds that relationship. We'll move on to uh, the next uh, next area, and that's driver training programs, orientation. And uh, over the years, I've had a lot of people ask, how long should an orientation program be? Today, I, I can't imagine any driver orientation being less than two days. I just can't, you know, two full eight hour days. I don't know how that you could put a driver in a truck without that. The other thing that I saw was that these carriers, they, in the driver orientation program, it was an explanation of how their company was operated, the rules, the regulations. And if at that point, in the orientation program, the driver applicant or the driver who has been already offered uh, a position uh, would argue with the trainer or felt that disagreed with some of their policies, procedures. They had no hesitation whatsoever of dismissing that driver applicant or new driver at that point because they knew that going forward, they put this the driver into a truck and send them out on a route or out, you know, maybe for weeks by themselves, that that that, that position, that behavior from that driver is not going to, to get any better. So the orientation program, you know, I've seen orientation programs go from, like I said, two days. I would say the average is probably into the three to four day, five day a week, week of orientation. It's interesting. We used Studied this in, in uh, as a consultant, I studied this pretty close uh, with drivers. You know, one of the first things you should discuss in the orientation program is paying benefits. How am I going to get paid? How is my family going to get taken care of? How are my kids going to be have health insurance? How much? Where's the the payment going to go for my pay? Or is it going to this bank, that bank, whatever? Is checks going to be sent? That needs to be, that's the lowest level for them. How are you going to take care of my needs before you can even start? If you don't start there, you don't talk about paying benefits till the very end of your orientation program, they're going to tune you out on everything else you're saying, or very little of that's going to stick because they're concerned about how am I getting paid and what are my benefits. Company mission familiarization, each one of these companies had a, a company mission statement. Safety was number one. It's the other thing, drivers, they need to know that they're going to be operating a safe truck. If their life is at risk operating your truck beyond the normal expectation for a truck driver, then they've, they've got a problem with that. They fully explained all company policies and procedures. They went through the truck, the technology that's in the truck, be it an ELD, be it an accident mitigation system, be it an automatic or automated uh, transmission uh, regulations. They spend a lot of time on regulations. I know that when I was a safety director, I, I don't care if it was a driver with 25 years of experience, they got into my orientation program. I took the position that they didn't know anything about the regulations. It's amazing how many times you go through the regulations with experienced drivers and they're, they're not aware of, of that, or they've been told by, you know, sitting at a truck stop talking to other drivers that they could do this with their logs or, or do whatever. It was amazing how many people weren't aware of the adverse, uh, driving, uh, exemption to the hours of service regulations. 
those kind of things, when you could use it, when you couldn't. Customer facilities and expectations. That was, that was a big topic that they, they reviewed in the orientation program and, uh, what their customers facilities, what our customers expect of you as a driver. And then, like I said, they would go through company policies and procedures. That was all signed off, uh, that the driver had received those and had been reviewed with them. So that's the orientation piece. Once you get out of that orientation piece, if you're an experienced driver, then you're put into to a truck and, and put on your way. However, as it rolled on, there was formal training that was done, ongoing refreshing training. These carriers trained all the time. Anytime there were new customers or new types of equipment, there was training for the drivers. Obviously, preventing common types of accidents. Defensive driver training was done during orientation. Typically, the Smith system, when you look at these carriers, and then a refresher was done annually. Obviously, if they're uh, hauling any hazardous materials, those things need to be reviewed with the drivers trained on the hazmat as well as security. Then there's informal training safety meetings. So like I talked about the refresher DDC, that was done annually. General accident prevention. There was always tips on preventing accidents that was sent out throughout the organization. Policy procedure changes anytime any policies or procedures changed that was provided to the drivers. Again, it was signed put back into their file that they had received that change and it was reviewed with them, put back in the file. Remedial training. Anytime there were accidents, there was training. All of these carriers had a disciplinary policy in place, proactive disciplinary policy, but there was always remedial training attached to that till the very end when they were dismissed. All of these carriers held safety meetings with their drivers. First of all, they were respectful of the driver's time. No safety meeting exceeds two hours. They were scheduled in advance. Drivers were provided the agenda and topics for the meeting. And this is important for safety meetings. If you Expect your drivers to be engaged in a safety meeting and um, provide you information that you need from them. They will come to that meeting with ideas if you provide them the information in advance. If they just show up to a safety meeting and have no idea what's going to be discussed, chances are they're not going to get engaged at all. So they provided the, the agenda and the topics that they would be discussing. Again, start time to the meeting, end time to the meeting. The meeting starts on time, the meeting ends on time. If we only get through half the material, the meeting stops. Safety director stands up, says the meeting is over. I will be here after the meeting to answer any questions. You're free to leave. You need to respect their time. I don't know why in our industry in the past, you know, in the past, there'd be Saturday morning safety meetings that start off with coffee and donuts. And if it got close to lunch, people were ordering pizzas in. I don't like to go to meetings where I don't know when they start and when they end. We need to respect the driver's time. They're just like you and I. They need interaction with their families, getting their kids to soccer, baseball, whatever. And their spouses have to have appointments, whatever. So respect their time no more than two hours. Don't hold safety meetings to hold safety meetings. If you don't have anything to talk about a safety meeting, skip it till the next one. How often should safety meetings be held? If I was safety director today, I'd be holding quarterly safety meetings. However, if through my analysis and data, I've got issues, I don't, I don't have a problem with inserting safety meetings if I've got a point 
to discuss with the drivers and we've got an issue. Okay. So safety meetings were all documented, topics that were discussed, the attendees, that was all documented, a roster when they walked in, signed in, but don't hold meetings just to hold meetings. Student driver training. I'm a big believer in, in training of students. As we go back in, in our industry, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, especially 60s, there was no student driver training. The training was done by uncles, brothers, fathers. That's who was training new drivers to drive. In today's world where, you know, the average age of a driver today is 52, 53 years of age. A lot of the younger drivers aren't getting into the industry today, aren't, aren't coming from a driving background or driving home. So they've got to go somewhere to get this training. Truck driver training schools, I'm, I'm, I'm all right with those if they're certified by the Professional Truck Driver Institute, the PTDI. A lot of the community-based truck driver training schools are, are great schools. They're all certified. However, once you graduate from a truck driver training school, in my eyes, you are still a student. The key to truck driver or to student driver training is a driver finisher program. So what's a driver finisher program? That's where you take a student driver out of a school that's completed the, the uh, formalized either behind the wheel and classroom training, and now you bring them and match them up with a senior driver as a driver trainer. Driver finisher program, to me, that process takes one year. So... What I would do, and I saw many of the uh, carriers that had success with student driver trainers or uh, student drivers was to hook them up with a driver trainer immediately and send them out. They would go out for 30 days. If that was route every day, that's what they did. Some days the, the uh, student would drive, some days the, the trainer would drive but they spent 30 days together. There was evaluations, weekly evaluations, both by the student and by the trainer. The evaluations were reviewed, reviewed by the safety director, obviously who's over the top of this. At the end of 30 days, the student was allowed to operate by themselves and they go out for 30 days. At the end of that 30 days operating by themselves, they come back with the student trainer and they're there again for 30 days. The driver trainer helps them through any issues that they had in that 30 day period and again observes their, their operation, how they're operating the truck. At the end of that 30 days, they go out for 60 days. So it's doubled every time the student goes out the time frame is doubled. So now they go out 60 days. Now they come back for 30 days. And now they go out for 120 days, come back, and you do that through a year. The reason for that is we keep the driver trainer in the program throughout the year. And the driver trainer is there as the, the conditions change for the weather. I've seen where student drivers are, are just thrown to the wind, and in those situations, I can tell you that usually from month four to six, after they've been allowed to operate by themselves, they've just been put out there by themselves without a driver trainer, that's where you're going to see typically a large accident. Why at four to six months? It's overconfidence. Typically, a student driver at four months, I've got this handled. However, they haven't seen all the conditions, ice, snow, wind, all of that. 
and now they're put into that, they're exposed to one of those conditions and they don't know how to handle it. Or it's just overconfidence they, and they get, they relax. So that's, that's really the, the process I think should be in a driver finisher program. The driver trainer, uh, has to meet qualifications, uh, and has to as well be trained to be a trainer. Your best driver is not your best driver trainer. That would shock me if, if they were. Your best drivers are, are usually pretty, uh, quiet. They're not outspoken. Uh, they just do their job and they do it well. But that doesn't mean they're a good teacher. So typically that's going to fall in the top 10% of your driver somewhere, but it's, 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 it's usually not your top driver is your, your best driver trainer. The uh, program should be a written outline, specific content. The length of the on, on the job uh, training needs to be identified written instructor manuals, written student manuals, uh, written student and instructor evaluations like we discussed. And then background investigations, experience, past work behavior. So we talked earlier about past employment inquiries and, and selection, driver selection. When, when I took a look at these carriers that are in the, this group, when, it, when I reviewed the driver qualification files of the students they had hired, they, they did a really good job of background investigation on these folks. They're looking for behavior, work behavior specifically. There's not going to be any driving behavior there, but there's going to be work behavior there. So when they talk to the manager of the McDonald's where the student worked at prior to going to the truck driver training school, and they found that that individual never showed up for work on time, uh, was always 15 minutes to half hour late for their, their schedules. Uh, that behavior doesn't change just because you went to a truck driver training school for eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever. That behavior is still there. For you to put them in a truck and expect them to deliver all their their stops on time isn't going to happen. So that behavior isn't going to change. Uh, driver supervision. This was another area that I saw these carers uh, focused on. All driver supervisors went through driver orientation. They needed to know everything that was being told to the drivers. And it was interesting, you know, this is the top, the cream of the crop of the carers I saw. You look down below and you saw driver supervisors that had no experience with driving, had no experience of the regulation telling drivers where to go and how long to get there. So they made sure, this group of carers made sure that there was training and accountability. Uh, they also did analysis by driver supervisor, or su supervisor. So they divide those drivers up that were responsible to one fleet supervisor. There was accident frequency uh, calculated specifically for that group of drivers. And if you do this, obviously, if you've got six driver supervisors, not everybody's going to be at the same level. If somebody's going to be at the bottom, somebody's going to be at the top. But you need to focus on that bottom. Why is that? Why do they have a higher accident frequency rate than the other supervisors? Same way with work comp, cargo claims, all that should be analyzed by driver supervisor. Road patrols and check rides. Um, there's, there's a few of the carriers that their the business model allows for this to occur. And usually it has to be a route operation. Check rides, I think, are very valuable for both the driver, the supervisor, and the customer. I think there's benefits all the way around. 
That's why I am so adamant on road test, even before you put somebody in the truck. I don't ex- exempt a road test. Never have, never will. Just because somebody comes to me with 25 years plus experience doesn't mean they know how to drive a truck safely. You you need to see how that driver's operating. Get out there, do a check ride, do road patrols. Telematics and cameras today were able to have visibility of that information. Uh, we can see what's what's going on with the driver. What is those behaviors? Uh, you got a hard brake event, and now all of a sudden it shows up that their seat belt's not on, or that they're on a cellular phone, and it's not hands free. So take care of those those items. You know they would look at those items and embrace that technology. Written safety policies and procedures. Um, there was a full company policy and procedures manual for drivers. There was a full company policy manual for driver supervision. Disciplinary policies, it was progressive. However, it could be one strike and you're out, depending on the severity. That was all outlined. It's interesting. I, I, I looked at all types of carriers. So you would see carriers that were working off of a, a mental barometer. They had no structured disciplinary program in place. And it was just on that day when all of a sudden it, the mercury blows out the top of the thermometer and, uh, they've had enough with this driver. They terminate. Then the driver turns around and says, for what? They don't, they don't even, they can, they're probably, they're running on emotion. They can't tell them what. It's just, it got to a point where they couldn't take them anymore. Whereas the disciplinary, when it's all structured, I've seen drivers walk in, hand hand uh, the uh, safety director the keys to the truck and said, here, I'm done. I'm being terminated. What happened? I had another minor accident. I hit, you know, I hit a pole backing into a dock or whatever. And they were already, there was a disciplinary, progressive disciplinary policy and the last time they had talked to this driver, they, the safety director told them if there was one more incident, that they would be terminated. So it, it's all structured. Drivers know in advance. They know what the policy is. They know what the ramifications will be for the actions. Designated checkpoint call-in times. With today's technology, if you got telematics in the truck, you can tell where they're at all the time. Driver performance reviews. Just don't pencil with the annual review certification of violations. Sit down and review the driver's full record once a year. Go through what they've done, issues that they've had, not just compliance, but, you know, cargo, HR, those type of things. Driver safety records. That's important as part of the driver supervision. And we'll talk about driver scorecards here in a bit. Accident prevention. So these carriers paid a lot of attention to the accidents and actively worked every day to prevent losses. So tracking of the accidents, it wasn't just the DOT required. It was all accidents and incidents, regardless of severity. Those safety directors, if you'd walk up to them and said, hey, what's your DOT recordable frequency rate? They knew it off the top of their head. They use the frequency rate for a lot of things. And today, that last bullet there, justifying investment in safety technologies is an important one. We're working with customers now at uh, the accident mitigation, cameras, lane warning departure, all of those technologies are getting placed in the, into the trucks today, uh, and it is available, and but it comes with a cost. And as the owner or CEO of a company uh, that's outlaying the the uh, monies for uh, these technologies, 
they're they're asking the safety directors, are am I getting a return on my investment? And if you're not tracking and recording all accidents and incidents, regardless of severity, you're not going to be able to tell them. So you want that that analysis in place. Investigation analysis, the carriers in this group here, uh, they did full investigations of all accidents. They worked with their insurance carriers, claims folks to determine, you know, how the accidents occurred. A lot of these uh, safety directors have, have already taken accident reconstruction courses. Not that they're going to reconstruct accidents, but to give them the, the knowledge and the, the skill, uh, when they're taking a look at accidents to see, see how they occurred. All of them had accident review committees. Uh, accident review committee is, as we discussed earlier with driver retention is, is a, is a piece of that as well. The accident review committees, uh, consisted of both management and drivers. The drivers were always trained for being placed on the accident review committee. There again, that was a, a level that, uh, you had to achieve inside the company, uh, as a driver to be placed on that committee was an honor. And if you ever been involved in accident review committees with drivers, uh, there's one thing that stands out. As management, we sat on that committee or admin folks, who, whoever, the owners that don't drive daily, uh, we always question what goes on. But a driver that drives every day has been in that situation before is is harder on another driver than uh typically management is okay so that's the interesting thing with accident review committee their peers are pretty tough on them because they they're out there they know what what can be done and what can't be done accident scene training uh procedures they had a full protocol what occurred when when an accident happened? How that that was started? When the accident occurred, the driver called this person, and then there was a complete procedure that was in place from drug and alcohol testing to securing cargo to getting another tractor trailer out there to getting the driver home. How that was all handled was all documented, and so. In one of my safety bulletins, I've actually written a whole article on, on are you prepared for an accident? And uh, it came right from these carriers. They are prepared. Uh, and when that happens, uh, they, nothing slips through the cracks, you know, getting the insurance company involved, all of that information. And then accident reporting, you know, it uh, there was always a reporting process, not to the FMCSA, of course, all that is is recording, but if there was OSHA that needed to be contacted, if there was an issue with the employee as far as fatality, that type of thing, then that that was all handled. But all of that to the insurance carriers, that was all structured. Driver vehicle violations. Driver vehicle violations are a um, a result of driver behavior and. Uh, these carriers monitored those violations through CSA, SAFER, the internet. They also had a company policy that required the driver to report any type of violation immediately to their supervisor. If we look at the FMCSA regulations, there, there are regulations that require the driver to report to the motor carrier the violations within 30 days of the date of conviction. Well, that means that your driver could violate the laws, not be convicted, hire an attorney to fight it, and you still wouldn't be notified. Uh, so these carriers in their company policy and procedure required immediate notification upon arrest, warning, citation that immediately their supervisor is contacted. And then from those violations, they would re receive additional training. 
incentives. Some of the carriers had incentives on keeping violation free. I'm not a big believer on that. Discuss analysis results. They would analyze the, uh, the vehicle violations. The incentives, I guess, there's one way that I approve the incentive, and that is on the vehicle violation side, and that would be going through roadside inspection. I don't have a problem with incentivizing a driver for a clean level one inspection of both the unit and the driver. This is taken out of their time. If your drivers are uh, over the road, especially, uh, they're not paid by the hour or salary. If they're paid by the mile, that time they spend a roadside inspection is, is basically that labor cost is theirs. And so to incentivize a driver for a clean roadside inspection, I, I don't have a problem with. Recognition and incentives. So as we look at, at this group, of motor carriers, uh, this was an area that they uh, they all participated in. Recognition for accident-free uh, driving uh, typically is non-monetary. Uh, they give the driver something that they can't get any other way except for driving a specified number of miles accident-free or number of years accident-free but be it a jacket with their name on, a belt buckle, a ring, something that nobody else can get, not the president of the company, the owner of the company. The only way you get that jacket is that you've driven here X number of years accent free. And that's the only way. It could be a decal on their truck, but that carries the most uh, weight with the drivers is a non-monetary. It produces excellent uh, results. When you present that driver with that award, it needs to be in front of their peers. That is the most impact to them, is to be awarded in front of their peers. Yes, it's nice if the owner's there, the CEO, but have it in front of the rest of the drivers. That makes the most impact to the driver. Submit your drivers for uh, state and uh, national awards. You know, there's the American Trucking Association uh, Awards. National Private Truck Council has awards. There's all kinds of award programs. If your driver does a act of heroism, there's the, the Goodyear Award. There's, there's all kinds of awards out there that you can uh, submit your drivers for. And I would recommend that you do that. These drivers do an amazing job, you know, to drive millions of miles accident free is, is just amazing to me that they can do that and keep everyone safe around them. The public they interact with, get their cargo delivered is, is truly amazing. Those people need to be recognized. Incremental targets, five years of, uh, or mileage of safe driving increase every five years. You know, and like I said, back up to the non-monetary, really try hard to give them something that they can't get anywhere else. If you can put their name on it, better yet, engraved uh, is, is good. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. Have you ever tried to throw away something with your name on? It's pretty hard to throw your name away, you know, be it a brass desk plaque or uh, you know, it was a hanging on your door or whatever. To throw something away with your name on it really hurts. So they'll keep it forever. I've got a customer that, that, that uses toy trucks, and they customize these toy trucks. The only way you get that toy truck is for safe driving. Your name's put on there when you, when you hit their levels, and it's, it's your truck. You don't see those trucks anywhere else. The only way you get that truck is to drive accent free. Incentives we talked about a little bit earlier. I'm a big believer for uh, specific purposes, clean roadside inspection. The other one is better fuel economy. Uh, we're working with our carriers now through a program called Elevate where we're looking at driver behaviors, we're looking at fuel economy, and we're looking at performance. So safe driving, fuel economy, and performance. 
To me, it's like a three-legged milk stool. They all have to be there. I can have the safest driver in the world, but if they don't, don't deliver anything, they're not much value to me, right? If they're not performing. I need to get fuel economy. That's where the, the incentive comes from. If I can save fuel, I'm going to pay it back to the driver, a portion of it. And there's drivers out there that will drive for better fuel economy, knowing that they're going to receive a kickback on keeping that fuel economy at a certain level. And the carrier shouldn't have a problem at all giving them that money back. Because when we take a look at the behaviors for driving for fuel economy and the behaviors of defensive driving, they're almost the same, one in the same. You know, we're looking far out ahead as the lights change. We're getting the big picture for defensive driving, but also for fuel economy, I'm looking to see what, what the traffic signals are doing. I'm not applying the brakes when I don't need to. I'm letting out of the accelerator knowing that it's going to turn to red by the time I get there. So uh, I don't have a problem with that at all, the incentive program. I think that's good. So finally, I just want to talk about the technology that is in these trucks today. We're seeing more and more trucks uh, come standard with accident mitigation today. Lane warning departure. Cameras are making a significant impact and traction in the industry. More and more carriers are placing cameras on, on the trucks, both inward and outward facing. So... We need this technology uh, in these trucks to save lives today. It's not a question. In some ways, um, we're late to the party. This technology has been out there for a long time. It's, it's sad, in my, in my view, that the, the government hasn't uh, incentivized our industry to get this technology into the trucks at an earlier date to uh, save lives. Every year, 40,000 lives are lost in motor vehicle accidents in the United States. 5,500, 6,000 of those involve commercial motor vehicles of 10,000, one or more manufacturer's gross vehicle weight rating. So it's been proven this accident mitigation technology uh, can, can reduce accidents or reduce the severity of accidents. So if that braking occurs, Accident mitigation braking occurs before the driver uh, realizes that they should be braking. That can significantly reduce the severity of the accident. So telematics is the other thing that is uh, on most of all the trucks today. I know our, all of our customers have telematics. We put them right on them as they, uh, before we put them into service or as they come off the line. And uh, that data is being monitored uh, by the customers through scorecards of the drivers, um, hard braking, steering, over speeds, those types of action, monitoring uh, MPG as well. And um, they're doing a good job of adjusting the behaviors of the drivers to keep those trucks operating safely and reducing accidents. I know it's a lot of data. As we look at telematics, especially, you can get flooded with data coming off of a truck today, and that is where you need to work with your providers to make sure that data is 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 accurate and it is uh, pointed or specified to make it actionable. If you've got to be able to take a look at the data and and take action with it, a lot of that. Uh, Data will point you to a coaching uh, event with the drivers. Like I said, due to hard brakes, um, over speeds, maybe idle time, those type of things that you can change the behavior of that driver. But you just can't keep coaching and coaching with the same results without a change in behavior. So you have to have that followed up with a progressive disciplinary plan. The camera technology just continues to improve as far as the accuracy and, and the, the clarity of the, the pictures and the videos, all of that. 
that just continues to increase as that technology cost comes down. I've talked to a lot of carriers about putting cameras in trucks. And um, I would tell you that the carriers that we're talking about here in the proactive, they put the cameras in. They want to know the, the truth. They want to know the facts. They don't want to take the position, well, we're not going to put a camera in, and then we'll try to defend ourselves as not knowing what actually happened. They would rather take the position, I know what happened, and then we'll defend ourselves from there. It's an exciting time with the technology today. I know it comes at a cost, but also we're seeing these these jury awards uh, just skyrocket today in commercial vehicle accidents. It's it's crazy. It's out of control. One of those losses could pay for cameras and accident mitigation for your entire fleet for probably the rest of your existence. So it's a, it's a choice, and I, I hope you choose to, to embrace those technologies uh, to keep everyone safe on the road. The last thing I'll say about these technologies is as you look at these, there's foundation brake companies such as, as Wabco and Bendix uh, that are in, work in this space of accident mitigation. Both those companies have uh, purchased steering gear companies in the last three years. So why does a foundation brake company in accident mitigation purchase a steering gear company? Because that's the next level. Right now, accident mitigation is just braking. It's not steering. But that will be the next level. Now they will control the steering in an accident mitigation situation, bring the truck back into the lane if it, you know, lane warning departure, those type of things. And then this is the building blocks as we see for autonomous driving. And uh, I think we're still down the road, probably 25 years at least to get to uh, 25, 30 years for a full autonomous society. But as human beings, we make mistakes. And those mistakes today are costing 40,000 lives a year. So if we can get this technology to help us, correct our mistakes or identify those mistakes before they turn into accidents, uh, we need to embrace this technology. Now that we have concluded the webinar, I would ask that if you have any questions about the material we covered today, that you please email me. I will leave up my contact information for you to email questions that you may have. Thanks again for attending the webinar. Stay safe and take care.